Welcome back to the Poker Vlog. This is episode number 250, and this is a very special episode. For the first time ever, we go to the win and play a high stakes session there. So we just get into a ton of really interesting situations, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to share it with you guys. But before we get started, a few announcements to make. The first one is that we're doing a meetup game April 19th at the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Hollywood, Florida. That'll be part of the WPT series out there. Then April 25th, we're doing a meetup game at the Lodge to kick off the Lodge Championship Series. And then I'm going back out to uh, the Hard Rock to play the main event, um, April 28th through May 3rd. And then I'll be playing the Lodge Championship Series main event, which is a 3K, $2 million guarantee. That'll be May 10th through May 16th. So uh, try to make it out to some of those events. If you ever see me, feel free to say hi. And then one final thing before we get started is I just want to give uh, a big thanks to Public Rec. They uh, just sent me this shirt and they sent me a bunch of other clothes. I really appreciate it. I have a link down below in the description box to their site. And if you use the promo code BRAD15, it'll get you 15% off. So check them out. Um, I've been wearing a lot of shirts and uh, my favorite hoodie is from them. They've been helping me uh, transition into dressing more like an adult, which I appreciate. So uh, check out their stuff, really high quality and really comfortable clothes. All right guys, let's go ahead and get started. Hope you enjoy it. I'm in Las Vegas driving by the strip in my Bugatti because my nicer car happens to be in the shop. I'm not going to Bellagio like I usually would though. They're currently not allowing filming at the poker tables. Hopefully that issue will get sorted out in the next few weeks. Instead, we venture a little further north to the Win and Encore where the biggest game that's open to the public is currently running. The room here is the nicest one that I've ever been to, and the staff is top notch. It's also home of the WPT World Championship, where I got the biggest cash in my career, and the One Drop Series will be hosted at the win in July. Honestly, I used to be a bit intimidated by this poker room when I first moved to Las Vegas, and I'm even a little nervous now, so I buy into the 5, 10, 20 game for $10,000. This game usually becomes higher and higher stakes as the day goes on. By the end of the night, it's not uncommon to see it become 50, 100, 200, with several hundred thousand on the table. I personally enjoy playing 2 5 or 5 10 the most, but I've always felt that it's important for me to push myself out of my comfort zone in order to improve. Plus, I wanted to do something that's special for episode number 250. We begin the session at 1236, just four handed. When there aren't that many opponents, there's nowhere to hide. You have to get involved frequently and fight for pots. It makes poker more exciting, but also more nerve wracking. Right away, we're dealt ace-king offsuit on the button. Getting off to a good start is key for me to keep the confidence up, especially after getting torched the last time I played in a bigger game at the Lodge. 5-10-20 at the win is more manageable bankroll-wise, but the skill level of the opponents here is actually higher than it was for the streamed games in Texas, simply because you're usually lucky if there's one true recreational player in the game at these stakes in Las Vegas, and the pros at the table are some of the best in the world that regularly put you in very difficult spots. I get the ball rolling in this hand with a raise to 60. The big blind makes the call for 50 more. We're heads up in position. The flop comes king king four rainbow. We flop a monster with our trips. The big blind checks. There's not much for him to have with three kings that are accounted for and there are no draws present. I'm debating between checking back or betting small. Ultimately, I bet 20. It's a tiny sizing to lure in someone who's probably drawing close to dead. He makes the call with no hesitation. The turn is the 10 of diamonds, so there are some straight and flush draw possibilities now. The big blind checks. We're going to increase our bet size, but I realize you've never seen the ceiling here on this channel before, and you really can't leave an elegant ceiling design out of a proper poker vlog. After getting the tree to seeing that, we bet 70. The big blind calls again. It's tough for things to get much better than this, but they do get better. The river is the ace of hearts. We improve to make a full house. The big blind checks. It's time to try and determine the maximum that we can extract from our opponent's stack. It's really rare that someone will make an extremely strong hand like this one when it's four-handed, just because with fewer cards being dealt, it's less likely that there will be a monster table at showdown. The average strength of a winning hand is less. Because of that, I tend to value bet lighter, and I expect to get called lighter from my opponents. I bet 230. Perhaps the big blind could have the case king, though I kind of doubt it. Feels more like we're up against a pair of tens, or worse, as the opponent is contemplating what to do. Eventually, the player makes a crying call. We get the opportunity to do something that I hope your captain doesn't do the next time you're on a carnival cruise, and that's turn over a boat. 
This pot really isn't that large for this game. Still, it's nice to immediately make a big hand and get some value to start the day in the black. Just minutes later, we're dealt pocket queens in the small blind. The button raises to 50. That's not an acceptable amount given what we've got. I three bet to 220. The button isn't afraid of a little three bet. He makes the call. We're heads up out of position. The flop comes 7-7 seven, seven, deuce rainbow to one of the better flops that we could have gotten. We're gonna probably fire all three streets unless we get raised at some point. Typically, I down bet on a paired board like this, but queens are somewhat vulnerable to overcards coming out, and basically every pocket pair will call a larger sizing on this flop anyway, so I bet 310 for value. Doesn't seem like the button is all that happy to see a bigger bet. He's in position though. He calls. He could have plenty of worse pocket pairs or maybe some high cards with backdoor flush potential. The turn is the king of diamonds. It's not great because some king x suited hands have a strong nearly dead, and it could be tougher to get value out of worse pocket pairs now. If I check, worse hands are mostly going to be checking back, and I won't be folding queens to a bet if I'm beat at this juncture. I continue to fire, this time for 400. This sizing will still keep in every worse pocket pair, as well as some combinations containing two diamonds that picked up a flush draw. The opponent somehow has trip sevens, I expect to get raised right now. The button calls, it doesn't narrow down his range a whole lot in this instance, except some suited hands containing spades and hearts had to abort, and it's not likely that we're up against trips. The river is another seven. Really, as long as the opponent didn't drill a king on the turn, we should be best. I mentioned in the previous hand that we went over that when there are only four players being dealt in, it's a lot less likely that we'll be up against monsters. Given how this hand has been played, we have to go for value once more in anticipation of getting called by hands like pocket jacks down to deuces. I bet 700 in order to not scare off those smaller full houses. The opponent floated the flop with a hand like King-10 or King-Jack suited and got there on us on the turn. That's unfortunate. We'll likely get raised and we can potentially get away from our hand at that point. Well, we do get raised. The button makes almost a min raise to 1500. I don't see him ever making this play as a bluff or for value with a pocket pair worse than ours because it wouldn't accomplish anything. I'm getting such an amazing price that in theory this should be a call roughly 100% of the time but I'm thinking back on all the instances that I've been min-raised on the river. I called and I won, and I realized that that's actually never happened. I reluctantly fold in this situation. It's extremely frustrating to have to do so for such a small raise. The button shows the jack of spades after the camera turns off. There's almost no way that he didn't have the king of spades to go with it. That good start that we had has been erased. We're down 1,500. We're planning to play a long, vengeful session though. Next, we've got pocket sixes on the button. I raised a 50. The small blind isn't supposed to be flatting often with two players behind him. He doesn't. He three bets to 220. One of the major differences between playing higher stakes games and playing lower stakes is that there's way more three and four betting in bigger games. I call for 170 more. We're heads up in position, looking to flop a set. The dealer puts out king eight five rainbow. We've got third pair, but the two lower cards are right around us and we've at least got a backdoor straight draw. The opponent fires for 260. This puts us in a tough spot. We might be drawing slim. I could justify folding or calling. Here, we make the call. We're ahead of plenty of ace high hands. We can put other holdings that are currently beating us to a tough decision on the turn. If we can hit a card that'll help us improve, like any nine, seven, six, or four. The turn is the four spades. We pick up the gutter. Small blind slows down and checks. We could definitely have the best hand. And if we don't, we should have six fairly clean outs that'll give us the win. I bet 620, it's about two thirds the size of the pot. The small blind folds right away. Nice not to have to sweat that one as we chip away at the deficit. We're only down a little bit at the moment. In this one, we've got pocket fours on the button. We're five handed now as Christian Soto has entered the game. Christian does some great work commentating for the Hustlers live stream. He's a well-known cash game player. I raised a 50. Christian has only been here a few minutes yet. He's already looking to make a big splash. He three bets to 300 from the under the gun straddle. We won't be folding any pocket pairs after we open from the button. I call for 250 more. We're heads up in position. The flop comes king queen four with two diamonds. We've got bottom set on a coordinated board against an aggressive pro. The opponent down bets at 200. If I were out of position, I'd play this fast and put in the check raise right now. Since we're in position, we can ensure that the turn won't check through. Even though there are a lot of bad cards that could potentially come out, I make the call to disguise our hand strength possibly keep the opponent's bluffs in. If a blank comes out, we could be set up to win a big pot. The turn is the deuce of clubs. It's beautiful seeing that. Under the gun probably doesn't have a strong top pair or better because he checks. 
Hands like Ace King and King Jack will continue firing, so will King Queen and better sets. I'd expect most strong hands to continue firing as well, like flush draws, Ace 10, Ace Jack, Jack 10 suited. Really feels like we're up against an Ace Queen type of combo. Maybe Queen Jack or Queen 10 suited, or pocket jacks. There's no way we're allowing our opponent to see a free card. We bet 600 for value. It doesn't appear that the opponent is considering putting in the check raise. He just calls on a board with a lot of draws. Let's just see the seven of spades one time. Nope. The river is the nine of diamonds completing both straight and flush draws that were present on the flop. The opponent checks. While the river card is scary, it's mostly only bad because it makes getting paid by a hand like ace queen much more difficult. Remember, I already ruled out the majority of drawing hands once Christian checked the turn. Also, going back to the idea once again that in shorthanded games, I'll be betting lighter and more often for value with the expectation of getting called lighter. We have a clear betting situation. I make it 1700 to go if Christian doesn't want to wait until the flaw comes out to see what I've got. A shove wouldn't be something that I'd like to see, but it requires some huge cojones from the opponent since I'm going to have a lot of flushes, straights, two pair and set combos after betting turn and river. My bluffs will mostly just be ace jack offsuit hands to contain a diamond or a hand like 10 9 of clubs. After about 25 seconds, the opponent makes the call, we turn over our set, it's the best hand, we win a big pot to get us unstuck, but no amount of profit is safe in this game since the buy-in is uncapped and the stakes regularly get raised as players agree to it. This one feels great to win though, particularly against a talented opponent, be sure to check Christian out the next time that he's doing stream commentary. We're up about 2,000 now and the game is filled up. We've also increased the stakes. It's no longer 5, 10, 20, it'll minimally be 10, 20, 40 from here on out. We're now A7 suited in middle position, I raise to 100. The button calls, his name is Boston Jimmy. You may recognize that name from numerous live streams at the Lodge. Jimmy's been in multiple vlogs of mine, and he organizes this game at the win. He's done a ton to bring a lot of action to this property. We're heads up out of position. The flop comes ace jack five, all diamonds. We've got top pair, but it's bittersweet since we don't have a diamond, so this board is likely only gonna get worse for us. I check it over to my friend. We won't be getting a free lunch. The button bets 130. I don't hate the idea of even folding at this point. Against certain opponents, I might. It just feels too weak to do that, though. I call, rooting for some card. Not really sure what I need. It's possible the 10 of diamonds might be the best for me, so I can justify folding to another bet and get out with a minimal loss. Instead, the turn is the four of hearts. It's a brick. I check. The button can keep the pressure on with a bet to make my day worse. Despite him being a good guy, he does make my day worse as he fires for 320. Boston Jimbo, you're killing me, dude. Our hand should actually be a pure fold at this point. We can definitely be drawing dead with our one pair. We have very little chance of improving, and even if we do, there's a high probability that we'll still be beat. I just can't get myself to lay it down. I make a bad call. The river is the queen of hearts. I'm in no man's land, wondering if that's a good card or bad card for me. I check one last time, expecting to face a large bet. Instead, Jimmy checks back. We turn over our top pair without a strong kicker. It's good enough to win it. Jimmy did well to keep putting the pressure on me and continue to put me in a tough spot, but I was too stubborn and sticky. Even though I had the best hand the whole time, I made a call and it's actually a mistake. Yet I was rewarded for it. Sometimes that's just how poker works out. Here we've got pocket fives in middle position. I raised to 100. This won't be a single raise pot. The hijack three bets at 330. You gotta have a lot of heart to play these stakes because people will constantly be putting you to the test. I call, we're heads up out of position, the flop comes ace four three with two clubs, no set, but we've got a gutter at least. I check, figuring there's a good chance that we face a bet, not this time. The opponent checks back, maybe he doesn't like the ace either. The turn is the seven of spades, giving us a double gutter. The opponent is a good pro, he knows that when we raise and fly his three bet, we'll have a lot of aces in our range, as well as small to medium pocket pairs that will connect with this board. I turn our hand into a semi bluff with a bet of 430. Before we even get our bet out there, the opponent folds. We may have had the best hand, but pocket pairs like eights, nines, tens, and even jacks will be folding there occasionally, as well as combos that have two overs to our pair. This wasn't a super exciting hand, but I guess it's just interesting enough to make the cut. It's not gonna make the so vlog. Takes it's not. <laughs> Somehow it does make the vlog, and this one does too, as we've got pocket kings under the gun plus one while the stand up game is going. The loser has to pay everyone $100. By some miracle, I managed to win my seat already. Several players are still standing though. 
I raised to 140, which is more than I normally raise to, but I need to charge a premium since I know people will be calling me with wider ranges in attempts to try and earn their seats back. The button calls, this gentleman is either still trying to earn his seat back, or maybe he's building up his endurance to be a human billboard at a busy intersection if poker doesn't work out. The straddler also calls, he's a stander as well, not to be confused with a walker, we'd be in a lot more trouble if there were zombies at our table. We're going three ways to the flop, it comes queen 10 8 rainbow, we've got an overpair but two opponents, it's a very connected board. The player on our right checks, I check it over to the button, he bets 220. The under the gun player must have a piece, he calls, I don't really like any of our options that much, folding is completely ridiculous but we could be crushed and the board will pretty much only get worse. Calling allows both of our opponents an opportunity to see a free card and improve if we in fact do have the best hand currently. Finally, raising could cause me to lose a lot more money than necessary, plus it opens up the doors for one of the other two opponents to re-raise, forcing me to fold. I call to see what develops. There's a bit of a scary situation due to the fact that there are quite a few bad cards that could come out and both opponents have a big incentive to play aggressively so that they won't have to pay $100 to each player at the table if they lose a stand-up game. The turn is the four clubs, putting a flush draw on the board. The under the gun player checks. I'm not very concerned about him having us beat since he probably would have check raised the flop with two pair better. I check to the button. What he does now is going to give a big indication as to the strength of his hand. If he checks back, we almost for sure have the best hand because he won't be checking two pair better here. If he bets after two players have called him on the flop, we'll have to be much more worried that we're up against a strong made hand. Luckily, the button checks back. I'm very happy about that. Now I'm really rooting for a blank. The river is the four of hearts. It's a terrific card because in the off chance that one of the other opponents flop two pair, they just got counterfeited. Plus, they'll have a hard time folding a queen to a bet. Under the gun checks. I don't see how he could have our overpair beat. No one should really expect us to be as strong as we are. If we have two candidates or people that we could potentially take to value town, plus a check through on the turn, opening it up for me to turn a lot of hands into bluffs. Under these conditions, I like to go with larger sizings than usual. I like big bets, and I cannot lie, I make it 1200. It's more than the pot. If people want to go to value town, they're going to have to pay a premium for it because the weather's just really nice this time of year, so the demand is high, plus I can't really take that many people, so the supply is low. The button has other vacation plans. He folds. The under the gun player is trying to piece our story together. Maybe he's contemplating putting in a raise as a bluff since I'll pretty much never have trip fours, whereas he could. I doubt that he checked trips on the river after it checked through on the turn, so I'll be calling if that's what he decides to do. Ultimately, he folds. Would have been nice to get paid there, but it isn't the first or the 15th. We still at least win a nice sized pot. It's been pretty smooth sailing so far outside of the queen's hand earlier on. Here we've got ace four suited in the small blind. It folds to us. I raised to 160. The big blind just graduated from rude school with a minor and making lives miserable. He three bets to 500. He's actually a pretty nice guy and he's very good at poker. He's been three betting me all day though and he knows that I'll have a wide range when I open from the small blind. The thing is that I know that he knows I'll be opening light. We've got one of those quintessential 4-bet hands that we occasionally play like aces since we have removal for rockets and the ace 4 suited has good post flop playability with straight flush and top pair potential. I put in a big re-raise to 1700. A lot of today's profit is on the line here dudes. We need to get this one through. If the opponent 5-bet jams, I'll be sick to my stomach. Guess what? Our 4-bet doesn't get through. Why would it? Well, we tried. We tried hard. We tried good, but it wasn't enough to get the job done. Don't lose hope yet though. The opponent just flats the four bet. There's about 3,500 in the pot and our opponent has 6,100 left in his stack. As we're out of position, go into the flop, hit the like button on the count of three for extra run good because this is intense and we're gonna need it. Ready? One, two, three. The flop comes ace nine nine with two clubs and a spade. Not bad, but it isn't that great since not enough of you hit the like button. We at least have top pair in the backdoor flush draw. We're likely way ahead or way behind. The pot is massive and the opponent doesn't have a ton left relative to the size of the pot. Ace high boards will be good for our four bet range. Small sizing here will accomplish quite a bit. I take out five black chips and I make a tiny bet of 500. It's actually about 15% of the pot. 
Even though the big blind is getting eight to one on a call, he pretty much snap folds. It's a big relief to win that one. Apparently, we got enough likes after all. The small blind is cool enough to let me know later that he called the four bet with five four diamonds. It sounds a little outrageous, but I tend to believe him, especially because I look it up and five four suited is surprisingly supposed to three bet and call a four bet in that exact situation. Here's a look at the chart from the Smash Live cash course on upswing that I was a part of. I have a link to it in the description box below if you're interested in looking to improve your game. You see that 5-4 suited is included as a 4-bet call, and this chart is for when effective stack sizes are 100 times the amount in the straddle. When effective stack sizes are 200 times the amount in the straddle, like in the actual hand, the big blind can call with an even wider range. This win gets us up to a new high point on the day. We're winning 4,400 in a fairly tough lineup with a handful of notable players. We're about to get into it with one of those notable players as we pick up King Jack offsuit on the button. The double straddle to 80 is on. We open to 200. The big blind is very well known and actually occasionally coaches some of the best players in the world, but preferred to not be named, and I've got to respect that. He calls our raise for 180 more. Pretty often you'll see a three better fold in this type of situation from a player, especially if they're in the small blind when there's a button raise. Here, there are a few more dynamics at play. For one thing, the opponent called in the big blind, the double straddle's on, so with four players to act behind me, I need to be opening a narrower range than I would be if there was only one straddle, or if I only had the blinds behind me. Also, the player who double straddled hasn't put in a three bet the entire session, reducing the big blind's concern and getting squeezed out. One last factor that may have led the big blind to just call rather than three bet is that I haven't shown down any bluffs, so my image is about as solid as it gets. We're heads up in position, the flop comes 10-9-4 with two spades, we've got a gutter with two overs. The big blind checks, if this were a normal button versus big blind hand, this is a situation in which we bet every hand in our range at at least some frequency because we'll have a huge range advantage where we'll have all the sets, we'll have 10-9 suited and 10-9 offsuit combos, but where our real advantage lies is that we'll have all the over pairs that the opponent won't have since they didn't 3-bet us. Because of that, we can make really large bets that are the size of the pot or more. And we can do that with impunity, not having to worry about getting raised. This is a slightly different situation because our opponent called with two players behind him, and it's not one that comes up all that often, but a lot of the same principles still apply. I probably would have gotten three bet by hands like nines or better, and most suited Broadway type hands are gonna three bet me the majority of the time as well. I figure the big blind will probably have a small to medium pocket pair pretty often, some suited Broadway cards occasionally, some suited connectors, and then some suited hands that aren't all that connected, like maybe King-8, Ace-8, and Ace-7 type of hands. We really have all the options available to us, including checking, betting small, betting a medium amount, betting pot, which is what we should be doing at the highest frequency when we do decide to bet, and also overbetting. I go with an overbet to 700. This will fold out all the smaller pocket pairs that didn't improve, It'll make hands even as good as King-9 suited and different when it comes to calling or folding. A hand like Ace-8 of clubs even has to fold as well. The big sizing accomplishes a lot immediately. We we'll rarely get raised, and if we get called, we still have a draw to the nuts. We have six outs to pair our King or Jack that'll likely give us the best hand. Plus, the pot will be bigger for us when we do hit. Unfortunately, we get called. We have to tread carefully from this point on because we could be up against a monster or at least a monster draw. The turn is the seven of diamonds. Hands like jack eight and eight six suited make a straight. It's not unfathomable that we could be up against something like that. The big blind checks. I'd like to realize our equity in case we're up against a set or two pair. There's almost no chance we have the best hand currently. I check back. King jack offsuit. Say something, I'm giving up on you. The river is the five of hearts. We totally brick it. The big blind checks. Might be able to get ace high hands with missed flush draws to fold or hands containing a nine to fold, but we aren't getting a 10 to fold. I check back. The big blind shows that he out flopped us with king 10 of hearts. It's a hand that I expect him to three bet maybe two thirds of the time under the conditions that we were in. We ran into the one third of the time when he calls and he happened to get a good board run out. Here we're dealt king queen offsuit under the gun plus one. We're going to be playing it though, it's the worst offsuit king that we'll be opening from this position. I raised to 100. Cutoff is the only caller. It's the same opponent from the last hand. We're heads up out of position. The flop comes queen jack seven rainbow. We've got top pair with a good kicker. We could bet or check. I check to the in position player. He wagers 110. We'll be going nowhere for that price. I call. The turn is the eight of spades. Not great since 10 nine makes it straight and ace 10 picks up the double gutter. I check. The 
cut off, cranks up the thermostat, the heat is on as he bets 430. You typically want to avoid these types of situations in which you have a medium strength hand that's unlikely to improve and you're out of position against someone who's putting a lot of pressure on you with big bets. This is what you have to prepare for when you're in these big games against good players though. I call again, not knowing if I'm ahead, drawing dead, or somewhere in between. The river is the ace of clubs, it's another card that I don't think I wanted to see since we're downgraded a second pair and some bluffs like ace 10 and king 10 stole the lead from us. I check, the cutoff must not like the ace either, he checks back, I'm glad to see that. We turn over king queen offsuit thinking that it could be best, it's not. The cutoff has a queen jack offsuit, he flopped top two pair and held on for the victory. We're still winning but our stack has been going in the wrong direction the last few hands. In this one we've got 9-6 suited in the $40 straddle, the button raises to 120. We're going to be defending basically all of our suited hands, I call for 80 more. We're heads up out of position against another good player, the flop comes 8-6 deuce rainbow, we've got middle pair and some backdoor draws. I check to the button, this situation is actually one that I described earlier when it's a button versus the person who's closing the action pre-flop, whether that's the big blind or in this case me in the under the gun straddle and the flop comes 8-9 or 10 high. The button has a big range advantage and can overbet pot with impunity. Like I said, the button is a good player and he knows that he can bet pot or more than pot if he wants to. He goes with a bet of 440. It's over one and a half times what's in the middle. It's a massive sizing. I know that he's capable of doing this with complete air or really anything that has a backdoor draw of some sort. Still, it puts me in a weird spot because our hand is too good to fold but it's not all that fun to call with since we'll have to fold on a lot of turns if we face more pressure. Proper strategy would be calling the vast majority of the time while mixing in check raises about 10% of the time. Now, in order to determine whether we'll be calling or if this is one of the 10% times that we'll be check raising, I go through a very standard process amongst elite pros. I select 10 random numbers between one and 100 in my head. Then I roll an imaginary ball onto a very large imaginary roulette wheel containing 100 numbers. Wow, would you look at that, the ball landed on 59, which happens to be one of the 10 random numbers that I selected in my head. Looks like we're going the aggressive route, boys. Whoops, fold. Nice hand. Nice. I have plans for future operations. Thank God for the imaginary roulette spin. We got the snap fold after raising to 1100. After turning off the camera, the opponent tells me that he had jack 10 and he was planning to bomb it if a queen or nine came out. I told him a nine would have made it fun. That's the last interesting hand of the session. Time to rack up a nice high stakes win. Played for five and a half hours today. I won $3,770 for episode number 250. Uh, that was a fun session. I mean, a really good group of guys and uh, made some big hands. Kind of kind of some really interesting spots. And uh, some of those guys are, are really, really good players. So it was cool to mix it up with them and um, ran pretty well overall. I think I was stuck 1,500 at the low point. And then uh, that was early on after that queen's hand. And then just, you know, made some hands, had, you know, some, some kind of fun bluff opportunities and uh, just happy with the session overall. That's it for this one. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you hit the like and subscribe buttons. It helps out the channel a ton. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to let me know in the comment section. I'm happy to get back to you. Uh, this, it, it's hard to believe that I put out 250 um, episodes at this point and uh, I just want to say I really appreciate you guys whether you've been here since the beginning six and a half years ago or you know you just you're just checking out my channel for the first time um, it's been a blast it's opened up a ton of opportunities with the lodge and WPT and everything like that so I really appreciate all the support throughout the years and uh, this was this was a cool session for me just playing against a bunch of guys in Vegas who you know, are playing for a living. It's, it's a little bit different than a high stakes stream game when um, there's a lot more shenanigans and everything, but you know, people are out there uh, battling, putting on their best moves, and um, 
it, it was great to come out with the win. We've got those meetup games coming up that I mentioned in the beginning of this. Uh, check out the description box for details on that. Maybe I'll pin a comment um, regarding those uh, meetup games as well. And then one that I didn't mention was at the, at the Gardens Casino uh, May 19th. We'll be out there in LA. So uh, hope to see you around and uh, hope you're staying safe. Good luck at the tables. Thanks again for watching this episode and for uh, watching, you know, since, uh, since the start of this journey. I hope you guys have, have enjoyed it. All right, guys, uh, see you next time.